Connecting the Inland Seas. And as the title of it may indicate, it's kind of two different projects, a seaway and a power project, which were together. And this was all built by Canada and the United States, as well as Ontario and the state of New York and their power entities, Ontario Hydro or HEPCO and the Power Authority of the state of New York. An interview with Dan McFarlane about his new book on the history of the St. Lawrence Seaway. I'm Sean Courage, and you're listening to episode 45 of Nature's Past, a podcast of the network in Canadian history and environment. It cuts through the center of the continent, linking all of the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. Long the ambition of governments, industry, and continentalist visionaries, the St. Lawrence Seaway fulfilled the mid-century modernist dream of transforming the Great Lakes cities of North America into international seaports. Between 1954 and 1959, Canada and the United States jointly constructed a series of canals and locks to create a single navigable system from the port at Montreal through the Great Lakes. Building upon previous navigational improvements, including the various Welland canals, the St. Lawrence Seaway opened for business in 1959. It was both an ecological and diplomatic breakthrough. The history of the St. Lawrence Seaway is one of tremendous earth-moving high modernism and complicated international diplomacy, and Dan McFarlane's new book, Negotiating a River, takes readers through the fascinating environmental and diplomatic histories of the St. Lawrence Seaway. My name is Daniel McFarlane, and I'm currently a a postdoc at Michigan Tech University, though I'll be moving to a permanent position at Western Michigan University later this year. And congratulations on that appointment, Dan. Thank you. So uh, we're talking about your book on the uh, history of the St. Lawrence Seaway and Power Project, but I suppose the best way to get started is to just give listeners a little bit of a sense of what the St. Lawrence Seaway and Power Project was. Sure. Well, it's it's a mega project built in the 1950s, uh, between 1954 and 1959, specifically in the St. Lawrence River. And as the title of it may indicate, it's kind of two different projects, a seaway and a power project, which were together. And this was all built by Canada and the United States, as well as Ontario and the state of New York and their power entities, Ontario Hydro or HEPCO, and the power authority of the state of New York. Um, so the seaway aspect is a navigation system which combines canals, locks, and channels for deep draft shipping. And the power aspect is uh, you know, hydroelectric dams and the reservoirs it creates to create hydroelectricity. Um, and so the seaway T- itself runs from Montreal to Lake Erie and incorporated the Beauharnois and Welland canals and allows ships to go from the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. That's, uh, in a nutshell, what, what the Seaway and Power Project is. Right, and a lot of Canadians and Americans have probably seen uh, parts of the Seaway, especially those living in Ontario and Quebec and New York. Um, uh, but it's not always obvious. I mean, when I read the book, it really kind of occurred to me that the Seaway is all these different pieces spread out over a really long stretch of the St. Lawrence from uh, Montreal all the way to the Welland Canal. Right. It, well, indeed, the the big work... Where you'd see it more obviously, it would be places like Montreal, where they redo the river and all the adjoining you know, traffic infrastructure and bridges um, and locks at Montreal. Other parts of the St. Lawrence, it's not so obvious. It's just a deepened channel. Um, mm-hmm. So it may not always be completely obvious to passerbys that it's there. So the bigger impact in the Ontario section of the project is that it floods out the St. Lawrence River for a long stretch, creating Lake St. Lawrence. But because that's been in place for 50 years, nature's powerful. It kind of recolonizes some of the area, so now almost looks natural that it was supposed to be a lake. So that kind of hides some of the impact too, I think. Right, and that's true of so many hydroelectric reservoirs that over time, uh, people get used to them and they become a part of the landscape and nature kind of uh, stitches around the edges and hides the, uh, the modification that may have occurred decades ago. Yeah, very much. In the book, I use, I think, the term hybrid envirotechnical system. So it's the artificial gets naturalized, and mm-hmm. in many ways, the, the natural aspects get become more mechanical. Um, so it's very much, of course, building on works like Richard White and the organic machine and that sort of thing. Now, you describe the project as a mega project. 
Um, and this is obviously tying into the work of other scholars. And in the Canadian context, Joy Parr has written about mega projects. But from your view, what uh, what defines a mega project? It, does it, is it associated with a particular era in Canadian uh, or North American history? Uh, yeah, I mean, on the one hand, uh, I guess it is mega project just because of a certain scale, and I haven't created a cutoff in my mind from what's a minor mm-hmm. to a mega project. But the scale of this is so huge that that makes it a mega project. And I'm just building on, you know, wonderful work by people like Joy Parr who've used that terminology. So um, it seemed natural to <laughs> follow their lead. But certainly, it's if I had to define an era, I really think it's sort of the starting in the Second World War period, can, and then. Can, Going to the 1960s, then it gets a little nebulous mm-hmm. um, in terms of does the era of mega projects end? Because we certainly still do huge projects. The you know the Northern Quebec hydro dam projects are in the 1970s, mm-hmm. um, but we start to see a bit of a watering down. I guess forgive the pun of some of these mega projects where people are questioning them and the environmental impact. So the era of unprecedented or un- unquestioned mega projects is probably sort of 1940s to 1950s. Right, and they they deploy, um, I guess, uh, cutting edge or innovative engineering and scientific technologies? Yeah, very much. So this is at the forefront of using and even pushing the boundaries on all types of new technologies that are involved um, with hydraulic engineering, um, with creating canals, with creating, uh, you know, uh, hydroelectric systems. So I I use the term quite a bit in the book, high modernism, Mm -hmm. um, to describe this time period or sort of this epoch when there's this belief in progress and technology to remake society and environments on this scale um, instituted by the state and with a fair amount of support from society that kind of I find that a useful term for characterizing these few decades of these mega projects and I want to get back to that idea of high modernism uh, in a moment but let's uh, let's give listeners a little bit of sense of the broad overview of this book you've decided to divide it into two parts. The first section is called uh, negotiating, and the second section is building. Uh, What made you choose this this structure for your book? It's, I guess, an intersection of several different things. First is, it made sense to tell this story chronologically, uh, for the most part. Um, And there's thematic Mm -hmm. organization within within the book. But overall, it's chronological, so uh, the negotiation naturally precedes the building. Um, so that was part of the explanation for why it flows that way. It's just a you know a straightforward reason for organization. But it's also because there's important, I suppose, thematic or methodological differences between the negotiating and the building. The negotiating, the first half of the book, is much more about the actual negotiation. So the diplomatic, political, and nationalist history that lead to the agreement to build the St. Lawrence Seaway and Power Project. Indeed, it. Uh, the idea of building this cooperatively between Canada and the U.S. goes back to the 1890s, but it took half a century for them to agree at the same time to go ahead and build this. So that's an important story, and so unpacking what I like to call the environmental diplomacy of all of that mm-hmm. uh, deserves its own section and requires some different approaches and uh, some different sources. So in that negotiating section, I rely more on you know the federal uh, records of um, Canada and the U.S., and, diplomatic records and that sorts of things. Mm -hmm. The building phase is much more, um, from 1954 to 1959, is much more environmental and technological history. And within that, then I move a little more thematically, but that's an approach, an opportunity to really really zero in and do some micro history on the actual engineering of the river down to the nitty nitty gritty, the moving of all the people. Um, The so-called lost villages were displaced by the 40,000 acres that are flooded um, behind the Moses Saunders power dam near Cornwall. So this was an opportunity to do a whole chapter on on that process as well as good chunks of chapters on um, getting into the actual, I was able to get into the Ontario Hydro Archives and their records and see the high-level engineering discussions and even the top-level sort of um, chairman of Ontario Hydro deciding why to flood here and not there and the, those sorts of things. So um, it, it's a, a thematic organization, but also a chronological, I suppose. And, I mean, the book is very obviously multidisciplinary, but what do you see as the advantages for scholars to draw from various fields as you've done diplomatic history, environmental history, history of science, social history? Yeah, I very consciously I'm trying to dabble in several types of history and hopefully do them all well. I have several you know, different types of historical interests and background. And I very consciously uh, frame myself and enjoy being an environmental historian, but on the same hand, I have very much enjoy doing transnational or international or diplomatic history, whichever words you want to, to use for it. And often those two sides 
don't speak to each other that much, but there's a lot of crossover. There's certainly great work being done by a number of, uh, by a few people who consciously are doing sort of this environmental diplomacy or blending the two. But um, I think there's room for taking environmental history in a way that isn't of interest just to other environmental historians, but to historians of all other types. So environmental history allows a means of telling national stories or international stories of interest to both countries. And so, um, and trying to blend that, hopefully, um, uh, you know, being useful or interesting to not only the diplomatic mm -hmm. political side, but then bringing in some of that diplomatic and political um, information to inform the environmental context and the transnational transborder context as well. Yeah, I mean, you can certainly see the interdependencies between the geography of the St. Lawrence Basin and the international diplomacy that went into creating the project in in and of itself, and and you really show the ways in which um, uh, in the mid twentieth century politicians and then later local historians describe the seaway as a kind of symbol or an emblem of binational cooperation and friendship between Canada and the United States. But the evidence that you dug up tells a quite a different story. Um, by the nineteen fifties. Uh, you show, I think, quite conclusively that Canada didn't want to develop a binational seaway, but wanted to create an all-Canadian seaway. Why was that? Right. Um, and I'd like to think that's hopefully one of the more important findings of my book is that Canada did attempt an all-Canadian seaway in the 1950s. Now, going back, to, like I mentioned, to the 1890s, in the subsequent decades, Canada and the U.S. had been trying to cooperate. In fact, at times it had been the U.S. that was the stronger proponent of of creating um, the St. Lawrence Seaway and Power Project. And so Canada and the U.S. actually signed a formal treaty in 1932, which uh, failed to make it through the U.S. Congress, and then an executive agreement, kind of like a treaty, but a little different, in 1941, which again um, failed to make it through the U.S. Congress. But at various times, it had been uh, Canada that had been stalling things as well. Mackenzie King, while he was prime minister, which was, you know, 24 years, I think, mm -hmm. wasn't that strong of a supporter of the Seaway and Power Project, partly because... Um, just of um, his electoral base in Quebec. Indeed, Quebec had been opposed to the project for a long time because they figured they would lose transshipment business at Montreal and Quebec City. It's only in the 1950s when they discover all the iron ore in the Ungava region, which is mm. bordering northern Quebec and Labrador, that Quebec sort of flips and now, or at least its government, and now says, oh, we're interested in a seaway. Um, Ontario, too, at times in the 1930s, so when Mitch Hepburn's Mitch Hepburn is premier, isn't that interested um, in the seaway for, for various different reasons. Um, but so all that to say, there's been all this momentum and going back and forth and taking turns, playing the suitor and all this sort of thing. So by the time the Second World War ends, uh, Canada, and especially Ontario, is desperate for the hydroelectric, hydroelectric development um, as well as the seaway. So Canada, mm -hmm. growing impatient, decides to uh, start filling out the possibility of just building the seaway entirely on the Canadian side of the St. Lawrence, mm -hmm. on the North Shore, while well, the power project would still need to be a joint project between Ontario um, and New York. So they start filling that out on a more pragmatic basis. But then, as I argue, the St. Lawrence nationalism just seizes the people and the government. So the St. Lawrence, building on things like the, the Laurentian thesis, um, by you know most famously put forward by Donald Creighton, argues mm -hmm. that St. Lawrence is um, a major determinant for Canada's historical development and evolution. So even bordering on being geographically determinist. And it blends in with some of the other sort of meta theories of Canadian historiography, like the Staples and Metropolitan Hinterland thesis. And this Laurentian thesis is at the height of its popularity in the 1950s. So I argue that this idea of the St. Lawrence as a repository of Canadian identity and a driver of uh, Canadian identity, very much paralleling the transnational rail railways and that they could link to Canada together east-west instead of while resisting the north-south pole of the United States. So the St. Lawrence becomes this icon and people, Canadian nationalists, you know, with the confidence coming out of the war in Canada as its new powerful independent nation should be the one to itself control the St. Lawrence River. So mm -hmm. the Canadian, um, the seaway should be all Canadian rather than shared with the United States, so a way of asserting Canadian independence. Um, that doesn't go over too well with the United States. Um, it's an economic threat and a national security threat for Canada to control the seaway. I mean, this is mm -hmm. a you know, we're getting into the height of the Cold War here, um, or the start of the Cold War. So Canada being the one who can control what 
nations can come into the Great Lakes. So the seaway is kind of inimical to American interests. So behind the scenes, the U.S. Uh, uses pressure and different ways of um, stalling the power project, basically to force a co or coerce Canada into agreeing to a joint uh, seaway, which ends up um, being the case. Right. And in some ways, it ends up highlighting Canada's uh, weaker position vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And, and I suppose to some extent, it becomes uh, publicly embarrassing for the prime minister and the cabinet um, that, uh, that even though Canada financially, uh, technologically could build an all-Canadian seaway diplomatically and in terms of international relations, it was, I guess, handcuffed by its relationship with the United States. Right. Yeah, very much. Um, this is this is the era that we usually see as the period of greatest Canadian-American integration mm -hmm. and cooperation. And to be fair, I mean, Canada, the U.S., Canada, the United States is Canada's greatest ally at this time. It's this is the time period where it's kind of turned from Britain to the United States as its ma main relationship, and the building of the Seaway and Power Project together does increase this integration and cooperation. But um, it's almost remarkable the way Canada tried to go a bit of a different way, and then, as you said, it shows some of the you know asymmetrical nature of the relationship that the U.S because it's so powerful and because Canada depended so much on it by this time period economically, there'd be repercussions if Canada um, hadn't, you know, cooperated with the U S on this. So Canada realizing it's in its own best, best interest, or at least the St. Laurent government realizing that decides it's, you know, it'd be foolish to go ahead alone with uh, Canadian seaway. So um, acquiesces to, mm -hmm. to this joint project. Yeah. And I mean, that way I think uh, your book fits well with more recent work in, diplomatic history. I think I'm thinking about uh, Dmitry Anastakis's work on the auto pact and right. the way his research uh, shows that some of the details of, again, what on the surface seems like a symbol of binational cooperation actually shows the greater complexity of national self-interest on both the part of Canada and the United States. Right. Yeah. So differing self-interest in some respect and the ways that um, you know individual rivers or ideas of nature and things like that can all uh, shape this this high level diplomat these high level diplomatic aspects. So the way ecology and nature can have an impact on major impact on a diplomatic major diplomatic issue. So if the project for a seaway and a power project on the St. Lawrence was kind of in the works or uh, in the mix of diplomatic relations between Canada and the United States since the late 19th century, uh, why did it take so long to build it? Why was this project not completed until the end of the 1950s? Right. I gave, a, I think, a bit of a brief background of some of the different failed treaties and that sort of thing, and, and gave some examples of the different interests. Um, so I mentioned, um, you know, the changing interests on the uh, Quebec and Ontario side for whether they were on board with this. But in the U.S., the main thing blocking it was um, uh, our, an array of special interests, usually East Coast, East Coast and uh, the Gulf of Mexico port port cities, as well as uh, coal unions and interest in the railways. They see a seaway as a competitor mm -hmm. um, for them, and not only a competitor, but a, one that's subsidized by federal government. So they see this as unfair, and they have a lot of power, so they're able to effectively block um, the 1932 treaty and the 1941 executive agreement in Congress. So in both those cases, Canada was willing to go ahead, but it was, um, you know, the political aspects in Congress, even though in both those cases, it had full support of the U.S. government or administration that was in power at the time. Mm -hmm. Every U.S. president for the 20th century had supported the Seaway um, in varying forms. So others have, when they have looked at the Seaway, especially from the American perspective, have pointed out um, that this is an example of how special interests in the United States are able to block projects that have a majority approval of the people and of of the government in power too. So, um, it's an important story, you know, about the American system of government, um, as well. And um, what changed things? Um, I've touched on a few of those. We have the iron ore being discovered in the Angava region, so it becomes apparent. Uh, the U.S. in the late 1940s, early 1950s, is targeting this iron ore. Um, as its main future supply of iron ore that it needs for its um, armed forces and armaments. It thinks it's the Mesabi range of iron ore is about to be running out. And then to get that iron ore to the steel mills of the Great Lakes, the St. Lawrence seems ideal. You just bring it down, the iron mm -hmm. ore down to St. Lawrence, and then ship it west. And meanwhile, grain could be going from the continent, from the Midwest, and from the Canadian prairies could be moving east. Mm -hmm. um, 
So that attracts interest as well as the ideas put forward of charging tolls on the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway. So it would become self-liquidating or pay for itself. Hmm. Um, and especially this becomes all really um, tied into uh, Cold War tensions. Um, so the need for the hydroelectricity becomes more acute in the early Cold War, especially as Ontario is emerging as this you know, manufacturing powerhouse. Um, as well, it's really important for national defense because if you build the seaway, the U.S. can build, um, to do a lot of shipbuilding inland on the Great Lakes where it's protected hmm. instead of on the East Coast. So it becomes really important um, as a Cold War aspect and even perhaps more so as a icon or a symbol of fighting the Cold War, a cultural way of fighting the Cold War. Very much um, Canada, the U.S., and then uh, the Soviets are competing very directly competing of uh, who can build and show off, you know, so they're sort of the best dam as a symbol of their um, progressiveness as nations and as cultures. Right. And you're in, by the 1950s talking about a massive expansion internationally of dam building um, within the context of the Cold War. Yeah, very much. It's really tied into those Cold War tensions as well as sort of path dependencies that come out of reliance, at least in the Canadian case, on hydroelectricity during the. Mm -hmm. during uh, the Second World War, which people like Matthew Evan didn't have shown, mm -hmm. shown quite clearly. Now, uh, you show really well uh, in the book the ways in which the Congress could obstruct uh, the executive branch's desire to promote or to pursue this Seaway project. Um, but on the Canadian side, there didn't seem to be as much obstructionism, though you talked about uh, um, Duplessis and Hepburn in Ontario and Quebec um, at various points in this history, either opposing and then later supporting the Seaway. Is there something structurally different constitutionally between Canada and the United States in terms of their diplomatic relations in pursuing a kind of mega project in the mid-20th century? Um, it would seem like some of the differences in how the governments are structured did play a role. Uh, chiefly, it would seem the role of the provinces in having some voice in the Canadian case, so especially Ontario and Quebec, in thwarting the project would be an important difference that the states, mm -hmm. U.S. states, don't quite have that same um, ability in the U.S. And conversely, those special interests that I referenced, so railways and port and coal interests in the United States had more power to mm -hmm. block a project in Congress than did there. Uh, corollaries in the Canadian case in the Canadian Parliament. Um, also, just there'd be some differences, perhaps, between you know the prime ministerial and presidential mm -hmm. uh, system. Um, at times, had an impact, but that was as much perhaps um, determined by personalities, maybe more in those cases than the actual structure structure of government. Yeah. In both cases, yeah. when the seat was passed, it's you know Saint is prime minister and. I, I think his ability to move his Congress or move his cabinet in the ways that he'd like, and the U.S. president, for the most part, has the ability to do that as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess the only thing that occurred to me was that the Congress had a constitutional mechanism to block a treaty, um, whereas the provinces in Canada have no constitutional power to prevent the federal parliament from ratifying a, an international uh, agreement like the the forty one agreement. Yeah, 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 that's extremely true. So that's what had blocked, as you said, the 32 and 1941 agreement. So there's no um, mm -hmm. comparable power in the Canadian Parliament that they do have in the U.S. Congress and with the Senate um, and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as the ability to just put the uh, – in many cases, they wouldn't kill the St. Lawrence bill. They would just put it aside for further study, which would mean it was basically – put on hold for several years at a time, which was a way of delaying it without, you know, completely killing it. So they did that also mm -hmm. a number of times. And indeed, uh, the reason the 1941 agreement was an executive agreement was because a treaty to pass um, in the United States in Congress would, it needs three quarters mm -hmm. support, whereas it's you only need half for an executive agreement. So that's why Roosevelt chose an executive agreement, simply because it's easier to pass. Right. Um, it needs only 50% rather than the, than the three quarters. So you're quite right to uh, point that out. That sort of constitutional or political differences was very important for the for the St. Lawrence. Yeah, and on the Canadian side, under a majority government, the Canadian government um, doesn't really have uh, the opposition, at least in Canada, doesn't really have a power to block that kind of agreement, um, even if it wanted to, or even if there was a particular regional or sector interest that could influence um, members of the House of Commons, I suppose. 
Right, especially this period with the large majority for the Saint Laurent Liberals, they there was little, there'd be nothing to stop them really within the Canadian mm-hmm. Parliament, uh, Ontario, you know, and Quebec perhaps. Mm-hmm. It's also striking to the extent that there was no opposition from the other parties for the Saint Lawrence project. In fact, many members of the other parties came up to push the Liberals to get going with the Saint Lawrence project because it really speaks to the wide ranging support, the way all virtually all Canadians uh, bought into this idea of um, the All Canadian Seaway. Yeah, and I, I don't know. From this work, if you could extrapolate any further, at least at the federal level, about mega projects in the mid 20th century, uh, I know from other work on uh, hydroelectric development in other parts of Canada and um, energy development in the prairies that there, at least in the 1950s and somewhat in the 1960s, there was sort of broad cross party support for big natural resource based um, uh, mega projects. Yeah, and I think that really. Uh, perhaps flows out of this sort of high modernist uh, identification of this is an era of progress, progress with a capital P, mm-hmm. but there's little dissension. It's that these natural resources are there to be used um, and to be exploited for the common good. So you see little political difference. And this is right before, of course, sort of the rise of ecological awareness too. So we have all these mega projects going on from you know oil and gas pipelines across the country to hydroelectric developments on every side, the Columbia River um, project is very ends up being very tied to the St. Lawrence mm-hmm. um, project, as do a number of others. The St. Lawrence, when it's built in the 1950s, is the largest construction project in Canada, and it's been argued it's the largest construction project in the world at that time. Mm-hmm. So it's very much sort of a, a school for engineers and the like for people to come learn and then spread out um, across North America, and many of them end up going to um, across the world as well as experts to kind of spread you know the gospel of hydro development. Now, you've raised again this idea of high modernism. So maybe just give us a sense of of what high modernism is and how this idea helps explain the history of this particular mega project and maybe this broader history of Canadian uh, mega projects in the mid 20th century. Okay, well, high modernism is a a term or a concept that's most famously attributed to James Scott in his 1998 book, Seeing Like a State. So it's this idea that um, the state, the government, um, kind of priv- privileges bureaucratic and technological or technocratic expertise um, to create these large-scale projects um, to make landscapes and societies legible. So this goes back to early, mm-hmm. earlier um, things in past centuries, like even just surveys or giving people last names. So efforts by the state to rationalize and collect information so that it c- can control things. Mm-hmm. So Scott argues this starts to hit its take on a new form and this high modernist peak um, in the 20th century. So it identifies um, the mobilization of Germany during World War I as one of the first sort of new examples of this large-scale high modernism. Mm. And so it really takes off in the centuries after um, all over the globe. So it's sort of an apolitical thing. So communist, capitalist, left, right is just this idea of um, large-scale technological improvement um, to make things better. Um, now, he does argue that there's this high modernist mindset um, is one key ingredient, but it also requires um, things like a prostrate civil society. So he identifies truly high modernist projects as really only happening in more authoritarian states. Mm. Um, so where I'm going with this, and this is building, too, on work um, by people like Tina Liu and Meg Stanley, who have um, brought high modernism directly into the Canadian context. Um, so one of my arguments is that The St. Lawrence Project fits all the criteria that Scott identifies for high modernism, Mm -hmm. except for the fact it's not an authoritarian state. Right. Uh, The United States and Canada, of course, are democracies, even if not as democratic in the 1950s as we might um, like to think sometimes. Right. Um, But nonetheless, the Canadian and American states don't have the ability to impose uh, these high modernist visions and projects to the same extent as they might in other authoritarian states. So I, I'm arguing that high modernism is the appropriate, is an appropriate conceptualization for this because mm-hmm. it just fits all the criteria. But because they're democracies, there's a greater level of give and take with civil society. So mm. the uh, government of Ontario, go- government of Canada, you know, they do things like meet with the people to hear them out about how they want to be moved and what's going to happen with the project. Mm. Now, a lot of this is just manufacturing consent, giving them a voice so they feel like they're heard, but not really listening to them. Mm-hmm. But there are changes that are made based on what the people say. Um, and not to mention that the environment 
this high level sort of synoptic view of Mm -hmm. the environment. Um, Local ecologies often don't react um, like they do on the models that are being used for this. So they have to adapt their plans in terms of the natural environment as well. So there's this process of adapting both to a society and environment, which leads me to call it negotiated high modernism, also because there's negotiations going on between mm-hmm. the different levels of government in Canada the U.S. So um, this is adding in what Lou and Stanley have said about there being, you know, local knowledge is actually involved in these high modernist maker projects, even if they're being planned sort of from ivory tower offices and large scale models so that it's it's high modernist in every way except that there's this process of negotiating uh, a bit with society with the people being governed and with the actual st lawrence environment do you think that i mean in the case of canada in the mid-20th century there's certainly in the work of of tina Liu and meg stanley and others is really drawing some attention to this moment in 20th century canadian history this peak of high modernism um, particularly through dam construction natural resource and energy projects relocations highways this is all kind of happening in the 1950s but a lot of the projects that we think of as the hallmarks of canadian high modernism in the 20th century are trans-border um, right. mega projects. Is there something about the international diplomacy that facilitated the uh, um, the more uh, high modernist projects that Scott characterizes as being associated with authoritarian states? Is there something about international diplomacy that limits or um, dampens citizen participation? Yeah, I think so, because there's so many different levels of government and state involved, there's that much less time and space for listening to, you know, what local people have to say. Especially when you go up the line, things get have to get negotiated or redone, not only from you know, from a provincial to the federal level, but then between federal governments and between Ontario and New York. So you're going to lose some of those aspects as you move up the chain, mm-hmm. um, so to speak. On the other hand, this cooperation perhaps enhances these types of high modernist gov- you know, projects. You have the two states coming together, and so there's important differences, perhaps, in the way they see things. But at the same time, it's striking the extent to which they're kind of congealing on the same idea of, <laughs> of mm-hmm. uh, how to remake things on a large scale and you know, not even questioning that it should be done. Um, so it certainly complicates things um, on the one hand, and then on the other, there's some extra facilitation, perhaps, and that's maybe importing in American ideas to an extent as well. Maybe mm-hmm. there's some role because it's an international project with the United States, so it's going to lead to, in some senses, a greater influence, perhaps, from um, American ideas, which has already been building these mega dams mm-hmm. for several decades, like the Tennessee Valley Authority, things like that, and um, you know the, the dams that already exist on the Columbia River and the American Southwest. So it's importing in some senses, you can even see it as somewhat imperialist perhaps, but um, mm-hmm. an American influence in bringing that into Canada. But to be fair, Canada is very much, imperialism in some ways is too strong of a term because Canada is eager to get involved in this and do its own sort of mega projects. Um, right, so, yeah. So it's not like and, it's being forced into remaking the St. Lawrence River. Yeah, and arguably um, hydroelectric engineers from HEPCO uh, as well as later hydroelectric engineers from BC Hydro in British Columbia and the Columbia River case, were participants in a kind of um, trans-border uh, intellectual community in engineering. They participate in international conferences, policy sharing between hydro corporations across the border. Um, so it seems to make sense that they would share these kinds of high modernist ideas in the 1950s and into the 1960s. Yeah, it's very much sort of this fraternity that, goes past boundaries or that they can almost identify with a fellow engineer more, even if they speak Russian. <laughs> right. <laughs> because they yeah. share that. And that's why I think there's a lot of purchase for this high modernism idea because it almost is this language that goes across borders and goes across languages. And it's even perhaps stronger with the Canadian American engineers. They exchange en- engineers. They work together. They work on each other's projects. And Canada is, at least per capita, the, you know, in much of the 20th century, the world's leader in hydroelectric development. So I'd make the mm-hmm. argument, too, that hydroelectricity becomes uniquely intertwined with Canadian identity in a way that it doesn't usually happen for, for other countries. And, and I think readers, too, will be struck by the similarities between the experiences of the residents of the lost villages um, and the experiences of the residents along the Columbia who were relocated. Very similar arguments about um, improving their lives uh, through modern planning, removing rural people from 
um, their backward, uh, poor lives and enhancing their lives by putting them into planned communities with modern amenities. Yeah, very much the Columbia. I mean, the Columbia took a long time to negotiate as well, so it could have almost been built before the St. Lawrence if negotiations had um, <laughs> gone quicker. And it's very much the same officials, so the International Joint Commission is involved heavily in both of these. And the, say, one of the main figures um, pushing... Uh, one of the main Canadian figures in the International Joint Commission, uh, General McNaughton, pushing for an all-Canadian seaway, was mm-hmm. the one pushing for an all-Canadian uh, Columbia project as well. But a uh, number of engineers go from the St. Lawrence project to the Columbia um, from both countries. So it's very the similarities are <laughs> striking between them. And again, the same thing of um, again for this capital P sort of progress for the sake of it's for their own sake these people are being moved they're, they're part of sort of this backwards rural agrarian way of life this is the way to bring them into modernity and it's for their own benefit this is helping them mm-hmm. so they may complain but that's because they don't know what they're missing we need mm-hmm. to you know bring them forward with the rest of the nation and then throw in that these projects will be for the great glory of the whole nation and benefit everyone as well and there's yeah (laughs) Um, Yeah. there's a lot of similarities and just as an aside this is a bit off track but you you occasionally come back to general mcnaughton and cd howe as these nationalists uh from the canadian side pushing an all canadian seaway um and it just made me think or wonder the degree to which in the 1950s there was a kind of spillover effect of um emergent canadian nationalism uh, during the 1940s and after the Second World War, as Canada comes out of the Second World War as the fourth or fifth largest military power in the world. Right. Um, and I wonder if there was a kind of spillover or bleeding effect uh, into these kinds of negotiations in the 50s. Well, absolutely. I think it's directly connected to that. It's Now they Canada has the ability and the confidence to do something like this themselves. It has the mm-hmm. financial and technological means, and it's a major country. So it, it, there's this... There's these competing dualisms in a lot of people's mind of realizing that they want the U.S. to play the leading role as representing, you know, the Western world against communism. And Canada is very much interested in pushing the U.S. to make sure it doesn't go back into an isolationist stance. And Canada very much wants to hitch itself to the U.S. wagon, not only for continental defense, but just economically. And Mm -hmm. I think most people in power in this time period are full aware that Canada's standard of living would drop by a quarter or a third if... Um, if not for the United States or trading and things like that with the U.S. So there's these dual tensions of, you know, we'll benefit from integration with the U.S., but nationalistically there's some opposition. So there's already some uh, different streams of thought which are fighting with each other and then start to become more apparent, I think, in the 1960s. But people are willing to overlook some of the nationalist uh, things because things are going so well economically, I think too. So when mm-hmm. things go well materialistically, then it's a little perhaps easier on the one hand to, um, you know, ignore whether we're being dominated by the United States or or things like that. So where I think this book really shines is its ability to move very easily between um, thinking broadly about the international diplomacy. Um, with characters like Howe and McNaughton and Mackenzie King and Louis Saint Laurent, and then getting down to the level of um, the residents who lived along the St. Lawrence, in particular, your profile of the lost villages. Um, So one of the questions that stood out to me in the end was, uh, did the residents of the lost villages uh, acquiesce to the demands of the Hydro Authority in Ontario? Um, And if so, why? And if not, what tools did they use to try and resist the flooding of their communities? Yeah, there was a range of reactions, but to generalize, for the most part, people did acquiesce to it. Um, And the reason is that, although most people don't want themselves to be moved specifically, they agree with the general idea of the project. They buy generally into this, the logic of progress, Hmm. the idea that this is something um, that's useful. So, Um, In many cases, even the ones being moved themselves don't have um, a lot of objections. And there's a general sort of – this is a different time period where I think it's a little safer to say there is more of a a deference to governmental authority Mm. and trust in the state. So if the government says it's good for us, we'll be – uh, more willing to go. We might want to quibble about exactly how much money we'll get for it, but we're not going to actually contest the underlying premise um, that we need to go ahead with this project. And – Partly because the negotiations had gone on for so long, many people, I think, saw the project as inevitable. 
in some ways too. And then the other really key factor is they were re- repeatedly told over years and decades that they would be the ones who would benefit materially that sort of the Cornwall to Prescott area of Ontario would mm-hmm. become the industrial nexus of Canada. Mm-hmm. That when you build the seaway, the Cornwall will grow to be a few hundred thousand people and all these other towns will become, you know, 25,000 and there'll just be, there'll be jobs and money everywhere. So it was partly the, the promises of prosperity that are um, leading them to agree to it. So if they would have known, you know, I think how it turns out, they may not have uh, gone along with it. That said, there certainly were people who resisted in different ways. So one of the ways is to ask for uh, different levels or forms of compensation for the houses they're losing. Mm. Um, so it was actually through the people complaining um, about replacement value for the houses that Ontario Hydro decided to move people's houses with house moving machines, um, which had been initiated by Robert Moses um, in New York City. And actually, Robert Moses at this time period for the St. Lawrence Project is the head of the New York Power Authority handling the the American share of remaking the St. Lawrence. So they sort of borrow that from him to move all the houses out of all these scattered little towns and villages into the two new modern towns. So that pleases the people because they get to keep their house. Right. And for readers on page 155, you have a terrific photograph of one of these house moving machines. And, and if you haven't read this book and you've never seen a house moving machine, it's literally what it sounds like a machine that lifts a house off the ground and then drives it to a new place. Right. Cause, and that's what many people were – some people were worried about, you know, I want 12000 rather than 10000 for my house. But for many people, it's the intangibles they didn't want mm-hmm. to lose. So life in a small town, their old house, life on the river, um, things like that. So people did complain about those sorts of things. Um, Ontario does set up a board of appeal as well as a commission to help improve recreation and parks, partly to try to, you know – compensate for what people are losing um but that board of appeal is essentially controlled by ontario hydro but nonetheless it is a a forum for people to um go and uh, complain or oppose what's going on even if it's a bit of a sham people did things like putting up signs um in their towns um, saying you know hydro is unfair or we demand replacement value for our houses um, and in the initial stages as i may have mentioned ontario hydro was often meeting with people um, so that that provided a voice, um, sort of town hall meetings to oppose things, even if, even if this is sort of manufacturing consent in some ways. Uh, people went to the press um, and complained there. Some people would refuse to sell their house, which sometimes they ended up doing better because of that. Sometimes they end up doing worse and just get mm-hmm. expropriated. And um, but moving houses probably would have been one of the more obvious ways that. People resisting, in a sense, um, forced some types of changes. So it's important to remember that moving houses also ended up being a lot cheaper for Ontario Hydro, and that's why they agreed to it. Right. Because it helps their bottom line. It's cheaper to move a house than to build uh, new houses um, for everyone. And I, I guess another key thing, too, and this was more the province of Ontario's decision rather than, than Ontario Hydro's, was they did up um, – the level of compensation given given to people for what they would call inconvenience. So they'd get 15 rather than 10% of the value of their house in addition um, as compensation for having to go through through all of this. And, of course, people do get a lot of modern new amenities and uh, new towns with things like our sewers and water supply, which they didn't have before. But they lose a lot of things they really wanted to hold on to. Now, I think the mark of a good book is when the author's voice and argument is really clear. And you leave readers with a couple of really interesting um, statements in this book that I think will perhaps generate some debate. Um, So let's deal with these bigger ones. The first I want to deal with is what you say at the end of chapter six. You state very clearly um, that this project should be considered a mistake. Why is that? I have fought with that a number of times, and people kept asking me, um, uh, you know, over the course of my research and uh, as I was doing the book, whether it was a mistake. So I kept fighting with it. Um, but in the end, I think it is because, first of all, I mean, to give away some of the end of this, <laughs> the Seaway doesn't come yeah. close to living up to expectations, not even close. Um, so it never ends up paying for itself. It doesn't become self liquidating. It doesn't, you know, it moves half of the cargo people think it's going to move. So it doesn't become this great econo- economic stimulus. It does serve to bring the iron ore to the Great Lakes and uh, wheat f- from the Midwest and the prairies. It is good at doing that. But um, about the same time the seaways opened, container shipping becomes standardized 
and goes global and container ships are too large for the um, St. Lawrence lock. So in a way it was almost obsolete when it was first opened. And that was partly because it was captured by plans that went back several decades, which had evolved, but it was too politically problematic to go back and increase the lock size in the 1950s when they're building, even though many people knew they needed to do it. So in some senses, um, it was limited right off the start. And now when you throw in the environmental damage that's caused by building it, and even perhaps more so with invasive species, mm. when you add up the ledger of the damage and not living up, up to expectations versus what it provides, I rela- perhaps reluctantly, and I, you know, after being forced to, then I say it's, say it's a mistake. Um, mm. But it's you know, kind of a line I kept writing and rewriting, or should I include that or not? But um, I think especially because of the invasive species coming later on, that really tips the balance. Mm-hmm. Um, because of what they do at the Great Lakes. So that's its own story. Of They even knew that was happening. They just There wasn't the political will to make ships flush their ballast water, but a lot of the invasive species could have been prevented effectively. So in a way, they're not the yeah. necessary result of the seaway. And I think that's a key point to your conclusion here, is that some of the engineering and technological limitations of the seaway and the uh, ecological consequences were... Um, this wasn't a matter of hindsight, that there were some uh, who were involved who were aware that these were likely to become problems. Yeah, and they even know of a lot of ecological problems, but it was very much the high modernist mindset or the progress mindset. They knew, they just Mm -hmm. didn't care. Mm -hmm. This was a sufficient byproduct. Yes, it's going to do that and that. Yeah, eels won't be able to traverse the dams, but who cares compared to the benefits that are going to come from it? It's probably key to point out, too, if you know, World War Three or another major confrontation had happened in the Cold War, that's where the seaway would have um, been useful. So I'm glad it didn't turn out to <laughs> be really useful. But in a way, they had built it for that next big war um, because of what they had learned from what they could have used during World War II. So it probably would have been met its full use if there had been another major conflict, you know, war or so on. But uh, luckily, there wasn't. Right. And that's, that's where it's maybe difficult for us to to think in the same way that planners might have been thinking in the 1950s that the reality of a potential hot war with the Soviet Union um, was uh, was more pressing than than perhaps now with hindsight that we could see that that conflict never happened. Yeah, I'm very much trying to get in. I'm so I've tried to do into the book is not be too presentist. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe more so in the you know conclusion, <laughs> but mm-hmm. well, I, well, in the chapters, try to get into the actual mindset of the time period. I mean, it's also important to realize, I think, that moving cargo by water uses a lot less fossil fuels than, Mm -hmm. you know, air or rail and land. So there still could be utility. I don't know if I would suggest that we need to now make the locks bigger to accommodate bigger ships, but it could be more environmentally friendly to move more things via things like canals and seaways than some of the other competing forms of transportation as well. So, on page 230, you introduce another uh, really interesting argument that I think is uh, worth some discussion. You write, I think there's something to the notion that a uniquely Canadian conception of the natural world was produced by Canadians' greater exposure to a harsher and more frigid environment. The historic development of economic, technological, and natural resource extraction activities associated with this environment and relationships with more powerful countries, primarily Britain and the United States, seeking to acquire these resources. So in what ways uh, do Canadians have a unique concept or conception of the natural world, and how did this end up influencing the St. Lawrence Project, in your view? Okay, great, great question. This was another one of those things, you know, I, I fought with and figured people, there might be some disagreement, but at least it'll create some interesting mm-hmm. uh, debate. In some ways, I'm buying into what we might want to call sort of the hostility thesis, Mm. That Northrop Fry and you know Margaret At- Atwood and other people have put forward that Canada being in this more frigid, harsher environment, at least compared to the United States, where most of it's more temperate and you know even tropical, um, that Canadians have a more antagonistic view of the environment. They've had to combat it more and wrestle things from it more. And even when they are able to, they just can't control it to the same extent, probably because of a lesser population as well compared to. The- mm-hmm. United States. They can't dominate their environment to the same extent as Americans can. So that produ- produces a slightly different view of the environment, which also then has a weird sort of offshoot, which is that Canadians see themselves as a land of wilderness and very in touch with their environment. So that's uh, sort of a different offshoot of that. But this idea that Canada, with all these natural resources, 
and that's what leads to its economic development, so fish, fur, and so on. Mm -hmm. But that then many of these resources, these staples are extracted, not for Canada's benefit, but then taken back to, you know, other imperial countries, so Britain and then the United States. So that leads to sort of um, this harsher environment, which is then not not even benefiting Canadians that much in a sense, because if they're losing a lot of the, the these benefits from developing natural resources. It also creates a different view of the technology that's used to extract these resources. So technolo technology was often imported from Britain and the United States. So again, it becomes the sign of sort of another country or imperial control. So the St. Lawrence, and then you throw in the unique view of the St. Lawrence that's um, Canadian. So the idea of the St. Lawrence being the river of Canada, the great river of Canada, an idea not shared by the U.S. even though the St. Lawrence, the upper St. Lawrence is shared by um, Ontario and New York. Americans tend to ignore the St. Lawrence. It's sort of, that's their back door mm -hmm. and it's sort of the Canadian front door. So they look away from the St. Lawrence and don't even put it on, you know, the maps of the great rivers of the United States. Um, so there's this unique part connected to the St. Lawrence environment itself, but then a larger generalized idea of um, Canada as a more northern nation and then the imperial past is kind of all blend together, I think, to uh, shape a Canadian view of the environment that certainly, and that's what the high modernism points to, is similarities in how to use the environment, but um, important differences in how, and again, this, I totally realize there's, it's fraught with difficulties to generalize on, on this level, but that there is, you can, I think, triangulate and postulate a different Canadian view of the environment and Canadians' relationship to it that differs from the general American view. And there's there's certainly a lot to this in the book for sure. I think another aspect that kind of comes out in this story and it can it hooks into a lot of other national stories about Canadian environmental history and right back into Staples thesis literature, which you uh, you draw upon in this book, uh, but that the environment in Canada and its natural resources going right back to confederation is is more than just uh, an impediment to national development in terms of the hostility thesis, but it's actually redemptive. Um, yeah. And it can save the country, and it's actually the root or the future of Canada, if only technology and science can unleash its potential. Right. And this book shows the ways in which Canadians, I think, saw natural features in the environment, and in this case, the St. Lawrence River, um, as being a kind of key, not just to Canadians' wealth, but Canadians' international influence and power. And I think you can make some linkages between that view of natural resources in Canada, in the case of the St. Lawrence, to other aspects of Canadian, Canadian natural resource development from the mid-20th century, right up to the tar sands, describing these resources as the potential to create Canada as an energy power uh, in the world, and that these resources wouldn't only just make us rich, but it would make us influential diplomatically. Yeah, very much. I think that's what I'm, the way you describe that is what I'm, very much what I'm trying to do. And I think what, um, you know, a lot of other environmental historians are trying to do too. The, you know, landscapes aren't just these blank slates or tabula rasas upon which Canada acts out its history. They're important determinants that shape this history ideologically and physically and technologically. And that, um, you know, the types of parks we have get into the ideas of what a city is about, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking of your work here and things mm -hmm. like that. It's just the environment is uh, very a major player in all, whether it's political, diplomatic, technological history, but an important part of Canada's history. Sure. And I mean, to some, to some extent, it may go to some uh, way to explain the, uh, the mentality of the lost villagers and their, at least in some cases, support for the project itself, uh, that the broader national purpose and yeah, making much. use of good. nature. Yeah, they're buying into the idea too. They have their own localized view of they want their river view and they want the sounds of the Long Zoo Rapids, which would be drowned out. But that's competing with this idea of we need to remake the environment for our benefit for Canada's national development. So it's kind of competing with it, even within themselves. Mm-hmm as well so these tensions as you say between the environment is something to be overcome or it's or it's the source of canada's future so the environment is something to be controlled or something to be controlled by in some senses 
The book is Negotiating a River, Canada, the U.S., and the Creation of the St. Lawrence Seaway from University of British Columbia Press and its Nature History Society series. It is on sale now, available wherever the internet is accessible, as well as in stores. Uh, Dan, I want to thank you for uh, joining us and telling us more about this, uh, this excellent uh, new history of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was, it was a blast. Nature's Past is produced with support from the Network in Canadian History and Environment. This episode was made by Daniel McFarlane and me, Sean Karash. Music for Nature's Past was licensed by Creative Commons. For details on the artists, please take a look at our show notes page at niche-canada.org slash naturespast, where you can also download new episodes, subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, and leave us some comments. Please let us know what you think about the podcast, and don't forget to rate and review this podcast on our iTunes page. You can also follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash naturespast. You can always get the latest information on events in the environmental history community in Canada from the Niche website at niche-canada.org, and you can find out more about the topics we discussed on this episode on our show notes page. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back soon with another episode of Nature's Past.